It was the February flood that well and truly broke the records. Record rain, record river levels, record destruction. But the storm that hit the lower North Island six months ago also broke hearts, ruined lives and destroyed dreams. The pictures of a little house sailing to destruction on a swollen river were beamed by satellite around the globe. Here goes the house, mate. The tale of a woman who swam to safety on the back of a cow made newspaper headlines worldwide. And it was awesome. <laughs> um, and she just took me on in the last 20 or 30 metres. But then, like all big news, it gradually became old news, stale news, then quietly slipped from consciousness. But this story didn't end there. Up on the floodplain of the Rangatike River, it's still being lived out by those who survived the floods and are now rebuilding their lives. In February, with summer drawing to a close, it was unimaginable that anything could upset the idyllic picture of life on this beautiful and bountiful river. The little township of Scotts Ferry is just a kilometre from the river mouth, and right in the middle of the village, Richard and Julie Hawke live in one of the few two-storey houses. Julie works in nearby Bulls with a local house-moving business. Richard is into taxidermy, and their children, Joey and Nicole, are just hooked on the outdoor lifestyle. The Rangatike River and the miles of nearby beaches are their playground. It's a different rural scene just a couple of kilometres up the road. Dairy farmer Bill Jamison took over what was a long-standing farm and set about completely rebuilding the business. He and his partner Jody Curry have sunk millions into this farm. The land has been recontoured and refenced. With a massive irrigation system and a new milking shed online, the couple are looking forward to a record production year from their 950 cow herd. Upstream and half a dozen kilometres up the road is the Parawanui Orchard where Paul and Claire Renshaw have been pouring all their energy into their apples and market garden business. Paul is in the Air Force, stationed nearby at Ohakia. <laughs> He's also a fire brigade volunteer, but spends the rest of his time working the farmlet with Claire, their daughter Katrina and son Carl. I'll come see what you've done in a minute, alright? Three families, three sets of hopes and dreams but could they survive the coming storm? Radio New Zealand News at 7 o'clock. Good morning, I'm Stuart King. The Met Service says drizzle has begun to fall again this morning in the flood-affected Manawatu region as a fast-moving front makes its way up the country. The Met Service says between... I was quite concerned because of the fact that it looked like the system had the potential to be even deeper than we were anticipating. Met and Service forecaster Andy Downs did not like the way things were shaping up. But this storm certainly did have some indications of, of looking like it was going to be pretty nasty, particularly in the way of wind. And it was those strong winds that drove the rain in. Um, the area that we probably had not anticipated was the extent of the heavy rain which occurred to the north of the Rangatiki catchment. The rain was already fairly steady there and it looked like it was going to continue on and it was for that reason that I upgraded the, the watch to a full-blown warning in the evening. I came in here about quarter past nine. Phones didn't really start ringing until about half past ten and we got some people ringing into the council's after hours number and those calls were being redirected into the emergency operations centre so we knew that people were getting in distress. What was that address here? At about three o'clock in the morning, on Monday morning, my pager went from the, from the fire brigade and it was still raining really hard. With his family asleep at the orchard, Paul was out in the storm helping people up the road in bulls. By about six o'clock in the morning, when it started getting light, and I could actually physically see the torrent that was coming through, and bulls was flooding in places where it normally doesn't flood just through rainwater. You know, there was definitely something major going on. Um, so I started getting a bit concerned. I, I never actually thought that our place would go under, but I ran clear at six o'clock in the morning and um, just advised her just to be a bit careful. 
put on the day before was closed and I thought I'll just go and check the apple trees before the kids wake up. And I came out the back of the shed here and I could see the orchard was full of water and I thought, wow, no one's ever going to believe me. So I ran back inside and grabbed the camera and in the between time, which was hardly any time at all, I ran back out to the back of the shed and the water was at my feet meeting me. It was just so fast. Woke the kids up and said, grab some clothes, we've got to leave. And they just walked, without even being told really, they just walked through the water out to the car and we were gone, we just left. And it was all within 20 minutes. The river has washed over a high terrace above the Renshaw's orchard and is now surging down onto Bill Jamison and Jody's dairy farm. It's going to be a race against time to get the dairy herd to higher ground. That was paramount. They were our young stock, they were our replacements, they were our livelihood, so we had to get them out. We went and got a dog to try and work them out, but the dog couldn't even swim across to them, it was too swift. So Bill tried to go across to them and he couldn't get across either and then we realised then that it was, it was pretty serious. There was really little we could do, we couldn't get to them um, to swim. The flood surged on, up ahead, hemmed in by the stop bank, lay Scott's Ferry and the Hawk family, who still hadn't woken up to the catastrophe heading their way. Well, nobody thought it would actually flood, like it was just all oh, the rivers up, and we've seen it up heaps of times, so it was nothing unusual. That night I was up probably twice that night just with the wind, you know, blowing hard, and yeah, in the morning, sort of had a look at the river, and it was pretty well up. Yeah, and just didn't think much of it, really, until until some fella from Horizons came around and uh, said, sort of, just get out. And I said, really? You know, serious? And <laughs> I went outside and there was a fire engine going up the road and people running from door to door telling people to get out. And um, I sort of didn't really believe it. Yeah, I thought we'd be home by five o'clock, you know. So I said to the kids, right, grab a few important items and take them upstairs. And uh, Nicole packed her um, a few precious Cabbage Patch dolls and <laughs> I think she grabbed her school bag because she's onto it. And then Joey appears again and he's got his go-kart pipe. So I think, oh, look at this, you know, we're out of here. And we all took off. <laughs> that was it, basically. Didn't sort of take anything or do anything. Coming up next, Julie and Richard's worst nightmare comes true. They're homeless, along with every other family in Scotts Ferry. By Tuesday, February the 17th, Scotts Ferry has been officially declared a disaster area. The settlements, abandoned and inundated, the evacuated houses uninhabitable under a flood of silt and sewage. Worse still, the flood water is now trapped behind the river stop bank. With no runoff, no escape, it's like a gigantic stagnant pond. It was, yeah, it was not a nice feeling to come up the driveway with the water lapping at the doors. You know, all our, all our possessions just floating out the door and down the driveway and out, out the road. Um, yeah, it was pretty tough. I, I stood in the middle of this room with an absolute sense of total shock. You know, this can't be happening. This just cannot be happening. This is our dream. This is our home. Bill Jamison is taking stock too. His new dairy is underwater and the cows are trapped by the rising flood. We went up in a helicopter to have a look at the farm and uh, with the help of the helicopter and boats and people, we cut, cut the fence and we got them out through onto the forestry tracks up onto a neighbouring farm. And uh, on the Tuesday, we had people ringing from all over trying to, you know, wanting to know if we, they could help us in any way or form. Dairy farmers were ringing up, wanting to take us, uh, would take you know, 20, 40, 100. As the nation becomes aware of the extent of this disaster, ordinary Kiwis send a flood of money and goods to help the victims. The Bulls Town Hall is inundated with household goods, furniture, crockery, cutlery, pots and pans, curtains, whiteware, 
electronic appliances. There are also piles of donated tinned and preserved food. It's like a gigantic garage sale, but everything is free for those in need. Yeah, something like this brings everybody together, I think. Yeah, it reminds me of the war. I come from England and it was just that same feeling. Yeah, during the war. Yeah. You know, you get some cold nights. I know you do. Good news too on the home front. The Defence Force has released vacant housing stock in Bulls. The houses are bare and basic, but they're also solid and safe. Volunteers are again on hand to make sure there's more than just a roof, providing comforts for people who have lost almost everything. Uh, yep, just. People like Kim, they come in, they put things away in the cupboards, and so that when the families or, or um, people walk in, they have food, they have um, a shower curtain, they have towels and soap, anything that you could try and think of that these people might need, especially because they're coming in from days and days of mud and slush and, you know, a sense of what's, what's our future. I, I just hope that if it ever happened to me, you know, people would pull together as well. It's the main reason why I'm really doing it. And if you can't help your own, then who can you really help, eh? With nowhere else to go, the Renshaw family moves into an Air Force house. Oh, that's where you are. I was looking for you everywhere this morning. Oh, man, I looked you in the pantry. <laughs> Obviously, we've got other people's furniture, other people's beds. Um, yeah, we'll just, like I said, it's a roof over our heads. A friend's farmhouse near Bulls becomes temporary refuge for the hawks as they wait for the flood to recede. It's not actually getting caught in the flood that's the worry. It's, it's you know, facing all the mess afterwards and the upheaval in everyone's lives. That is a township of Kawangaroa, 15 k's east of Wanganui. Tonight... As the stories and the pictures of the floods fill the news pages and television, mainstream New Zealand digs deep to help the homeless. The home show alone raises $1.3 million for the flood victims. Yeah, that's for the flood people. That's nice of you. While the money streams in, there's no immediate help for Scotts Ferry. Power lines are down. No one can get here to repair anything. And the water's just blocked in by the stop bank. It's being held in. It's a big lake here. Worse still, Parawanui Road, which links the ferry to Bulls, is cut by a washout. That means that local government, civil defence volunteers and contractors can't reach the township. OK, well, we'll just have a quick, quick start. Morning, everyone. Meeting in an old schoolhouse, the locals take the situation into their own hands. That's the only option we've got. Farmers like Bill Jamison and Paul Renshaw can't wait for outside help. Hugh Delrymple suggests they use farm machinery to cut the stop bank and drain the flood back into the river. It's a drastic measure, but it's the only way to get the water out of town and off drenched paddocks. So that we can cut a channel. Uh... Yeah, be a little while. Yeah, no, I'll be on my way shortly, folks. Uh... Six days after the deluge, the water has subsided sufficiently for the authorities to allow Scotts Ferry residents to return. It's a sad homecoming. Remember, we've had five days to contemplate what we're going to find here. So, you know, we're... we're uh, Accepting, I suppose, that we just need to get in here and clean up. But we're lucky. We're young. We've got lots of friends and help. A lot of the older people here have uh, taken it really badly. Just the personal things. Your papers. Our passports. We have to go through all that rigmarole. Just it takes another year out of our lives, though. They're going to take 12 months to put us back into where we were. We're a year Mother. older, aren't we? And that's, if I've only got, say, ten years, I'm only going to have nine, aren't I? Yeah. 
Returning residents have barely had a chance to assess the damage when there's a surprise visit from a top-level delegation. It's something that's on the TV screen, but until you come and actually see it and see what it's meant to families, you don't get the full picture. This could be my parents, could be my home, could be any of us, and I think we all deeply empathise with people that this has happened to. Well, I just sort of walked out the garage door and there she was, and she shook my hand. Yeah, quite surprised to see her. <laughs> we had a wee chat. I was pleasantly surprised at um, the caring uh, shown by her, actually. Helen Clark also experienced firsthand the disgusting smell of Scott's Ferry. Silt, sewage and spoilt food, as well as fish and game trophies. Richard Hawke's taxidermy business is out of business. Stuffed, I'd say. Pretty much stuffed. Hello, Bill speaking. In financial terms, Bill Jamison's business has taken an even bigger hit. We lost houses, irrigation, we lost tractors, diggers, bikes. The whole infrastructure of the farm was wiped out. Um, milking shed, everything was gone. One day you've got income, next day you've got nothing. His cows are safe on other farms, but the biggest worry is Bill Jamison's new state-of-the-art dairy. The Rotary Shed is capable of milking 80 cows simultaneously. It cost well over a million dollars less than two years ago, but now all its complex electronic and mechanical equipment is ruined. We've cleaned up all the silt and tidied up the shed the best we could, but we've got no power, we've got no water, we've got no farm water, we've got... Yeah, it's uh, just a bit daunting, actually. The silt's got in, and, and there's no guarantee on it in six months' time with the silt in there, it'll just wear the bearings out, so all these bearings have to be replaced. These are the brains of the outfit here. Uh, all this has got to be replaced. Uh, we're talking upwards of over $300,000. It's something that we could have done without, but that's Mother Nature. That's Mother Nature. The ground is too soggy to do anything, and besides, the workforce faces a housing crisis. All the farm cottages have had the flood through them, and only the main house remained high and dry, but it got pretty crowded. Having that many adults in the house, not being able to flush toilets and things like that meant initially I just went and got buckets of flood water out from the paddock and we just used that to flush toilets until we got something hooked up with a generator. And we were lucky we had gas in the gas barbecue, so that was cooking. And yeah, and we're lucky it was a big house because everybody kind of had their own room. Halfway back towards Bulls on the Paruanui Road, Paul and Claire Renshaw are coming to terms with a dream that's now become a nightmare. The main apple crop was just a week away from picking. Their cash crops of sweet corn and squash are simply washed away. The timing couldn't be worse. Another week or so and the apples would have been in the bins in the cool store and covered by insurance. <laughs> Paul and Claire, Katrina and little Carl make a family chore of the heartbreaking job of stripping the apple trees. The spoiled fruit is only fit to be fed to sheep and cattle. Even when the layer of silt is cleared from the roots, there's no guarantee that the trees have not been ruined. You get the stalk with it like that. You hold on to one end, I'll hold on to the other. Okay. Ready? Ready? Hold on, hold on tight. In the midst of all this, the rain starts coming down again. It's just two weeks after the deluge, the ground can't take any more. The river is up again and threatening to burst its banks. 
I was surprised at how uncertain I felt when I knew all that uh, rain had come and I was worrying. And If we'd have been living here, I'm sure that we would have packed up, moved everything up and gone. You don't really know if the water's going to come over again and every time it rains you're going to be scared and not know what's going to happen. Saving what's left of the damaged houses is top priority now and residents and volunteers swing into demolition mode. Before the homes can be rebuilt, every sheet of waterlogged wall lining has to be ripped out. The house frames must be left exposed to the air so structural timbers can dry out before the rot sets in. Coming up, Bill gets a visit from Fonterra and a nasty surprise. Where do we stand with the company now? We're losing between 35 and 40 odd thousand a week. You do worry about it, but at the end of the day, you've got to get on and make it work. So um, you're more concerned about how the farm is going to work in time, in, in two months or six months, uh, through the money that we're spending at the moment. Bill and Jody have been looking forward to the arrival of this visitor. They're hoping that Robert Dabb, a senior Fonterra manager, will throw them a lifeline. We had about half a dozen staff here living because we've lost two houses. OK, it's two weeks since it happened, but it really hit us on Saturday night when everybody went. And she basically caught up with us and we thought, well, hell, we're in, we're in, we're in dire straits here. So that's why we've called you in. The company hasn't come up with anything... To From the point. giant dairy corporation, so there's sympathy, but little consolation. Fonterra offers just 10 days payment, covering the period that the milk tanker couldn't get to their farm gate. But if we could get to the farm gate, yes. and either the tanker tracks in disarray or yes. there's no milk at the dairy, yes. then that's when it's got to stop. Well, we're two weeks down the track, Robert. Where do we stand with the company now? Okay, and if they, from, there, from now on, you could say, if there's no milk to come, we obviously won't be paying for it. Yes. It wasn't your fault we couldn't get down the road. Yes. Obviously not your fault that you've got 140 hectares underwater either. No. But there's a, a line sort of basically at the farm gate that the company draws. So, you know, looking at that, that's, we're, we're down the tubes 400, over 400,000 straight away. Yep. By mid-March, one month after the deluge, the politicians have got their act together and the news is good. What government has set out to do is to provide farmers with an effective helping hand. Jim Sutton says Cabinet agreed to the money with barely a murmur. The land ravaged by storms is some of the country's most fertile and the price of restoring it pales next to the cost of leaving farmers to fix it on their own. The announcement's a great relief for Bill Jamison. Uh, the flood relief package will, in some way or form, will help us in, 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 uh, in regrassing. It doesn't cover everything, but it's a great help. But for the Renshaws, the farmer's package is no comfort. Compensation only cuts in above a $10,000 threshold. To whack a $10,000 excess on that, we believe, is, is unfair. Um, we've got a, a fairly small block, but but we rely on that money. You know, that's, that's a huge chunk of our, of our yearly income. And to not kind of get any assistance from the government is sort of a bit gut-wrenching. It feels that um, they've catered for the residential people and they've catered for the farms, but they've sort of missed out the small block holders in between. The central field days at Manfield give the couple a break from the orchard, but one of the displays gives clear inspiration and a new idea for their lifestyle block. Oh, they're so cute. You, you can't say no to those, can you? You look at their faces and they're like, oh, aren't we lovely? <laughs> Apparently for a, um, a female you can pay anything from five to 15,000. I think it would take a long time before it made money though. <laughs> yeah. But it's obviously a huge risk when I mean, you put that amount of money into one or two animals um, you know. but I'd like to see it as a bit of a sideline you know from the orchard 
There's a lot of work in the cropping that we did, um, not having big machinery and that to do it. There was a lot of manual work and just to see all that go to waste. Yeah, the yeah. land that we cropped last year or this year that we lost, we're, um, we're going to put that back into grass and put animals on it mm. and, and just... Your packers. <laughs> <laughs> The waterlogged pasture on Bill and Jody's farm means that it'll be months before any of their widely dispersed dairy herd can return to Scotts Ferry. But morale is boosted by the arrival of a group of Taranaki farmers. They are willing to listen and promise to return and help get the farm back into production. Absolutely unbelievable. Ooh. Didn't think of like this. Four burgers. We parked the boat in here and just walked, you know, <laughs> no, we sort of came in the, through the window. <laughs> so you're lucky you got a boat? Oh, we haven't got a boat, but neighbours here, today. So. You getting one? Sorry? Yeah. Are you getting one? It's on the, the shopping Well, our thoughts were sort of along the lines of sort of a district, yeah, going to another district with, with people, yeah. men and women, to do what's if is necessary and prepared to get their hands dirty. Yeah, yeah. The support that we're getting is, oh, is huge. They don't have to come down and they just want to see what they can do and once we get a bit further on and, and you know, they can make things happen a lot quicker. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite heartening actually. Obviously you can see the water's got right in around this eye here. You just pin that back in. Once I've sort of got them back in shape again, I'll just, just, uh, just walk paint up the nose and around the eyes and yeah, she'll be good as new. It's a big blue nose. Uh, Thanks to that marvel of modern technology, the water blaster, most of Richard Hawke's taxidermy is salvable, but the rest of the tools and house contents are history. Thinking about not going back actually opened up about another hundred cans of worms, so the easier um, thing is probably to go home. If we can get home in three months, uh, then Richard can get his business going um, quicker, and that's really important as well. Yeah, I think we're going to go full steam ahead on getting it fixed up and then face the music once we're back home. Like far too many New Zealanders, Bill and Jody are underinsured and some of their risks were uninsurable. Finding out just where they stand adds an additional layer of stress and worry. I mean, like, really, if you want it replaced at what we have, we're yeah. going to have to do that. Yeah, true. Because it's going to be, there's no, we haven't put much... While the drama of the floods pushes everything else into the background, jody has been keeping the news of her pregnancy on a need-to-know basis. <laughs> oh, what have we got here? Well, even if you don't use it on the cot, you can use it like when the baby lies on the floor and has a kick around and stuff like that. Oh, on. awesome. In this close-knit community, word soon gets out. Claire Renshaw is one of the first to offer her congratulations. It's good now, actually, to have something positive to focus on as well. You know, something outside the flood and the farm and everything, just to have something else to, to look forward to. But are they looking for a boy or a girl? As long as it's healthy, we don't really care. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Bill wants it. it doesn't mind as long as it knows how to open gates at the earliest of ages. <laughs> when we return, expert opinion on the long-term future of Scott's Ferry, and it's not a pretty picture. Back at Scotts Ferry, Julie Hawke is going full steam ahead, getting her home shipshape. I'm very tempted to get um, the moisture man down here and do some tests maybe in one more week because they told me that I had to wait three weeks from when we got in here. It's been two. Um, if I give it another week, that's three, isn't it? She's a bit of a mover. She's not one to sit around at the... Uh grass grow under her feet. I've got everybody's cell phone number, home <laughs> numbers, after hour numbers, I'm on the mail loop. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and that gets results. Yeah. You know, I have good contacts with builders and plumbers and everybody, electricians, and, and they're all really good to me. And they've all raced down there and done what has to be done. Julie has also decided that the flood has provided the opportunity to make over the family home. The pain of the flood is eased by up-to-date and comprehensive insurance cover. See, I hate that mustard. 
Well, we end up with a brand new house. I mean, that's all very nice. But if you ask me if I would have it happen so that I could have that house, I'd say no. <laughs> I'm really happy with that. Yep, that's the one. Yep, OK. I'll write down the name of that one. When I want something, I get it straight away. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being evil. <laughs> The pace of recovery picks up as silt-covered paddocks are re-sown for spring and summer pasture. With his taxidermy business washed out of business for the time being, Richard Hawke is able to divide his time between helping on neighbouring farms and supervising the demolition work on the family home. Julie's grand vision needs room to grow. A neighbour who drops by to help is motorsport legend Chris Amon. He's lived in Scotts Ferry all his life. Our family uh, owned this area since 1858, I think. Uh, and I've been around here off and on for 60 years. <laughs> um, I thought I knew the area pretty well, but this is just amazing. The old Amon property is now farmed by Bill and Jody, while Chris owns a smaller acreage downstream. The sheer amount of sediment that the big flood washed down into this reach of the river is now preying on Chris Amon's mind. I mean, I have no figures to go on, but you, just from the appearance at low tide, it would appear to have, um, have risen, which could have the implication, obviously, in the future of um, a, a lesser flood could have almost the same effect. A few weeks later, Chris Amon's gut feeling about the river being silted up is dramatically confirmed. Landcare scientist Dr Troy Baisden has been investigating just how much debris was swept down in February's flood. At its height, he took measurements from the Manawatu River at Palmerston North. We found that there was 28 tonnes of sediment going underneath the bridge every second. That's the equivalent of three 10-tonne trucks going down a three-lane motorway so that th three trucks are passing you every second. Just think about that. That's an amazing amount of sediment passing you by. Troy Baisden says what happened in the Manawatu also happened in the Rangatike, and he has another graphic metaphor to explain just how much soil the February storm scoured out of high country farms and dumped in the region's riverbeds. There was about 20,000 hectares of land that slipped on the day of the flood. That's an area that's about the size of the city of Palmerston North. Nearly a meter of soil slipped off that land and went downhill and ended up somewhere else. Measuring just how much of that high country land ended up in the Rangatike is now an urgent priority for Horizons Regional Council. Council technical staff and engineers are surveying cross sections of the river at more than 100 sites and their findings do not bode well for the future. The bed level is progressively rising uh, as a result of the build-up of gravels and silts. However, the flood levels were higher than we would have expected, even given the exceptional flood event that occurred. And uh, we suspect that there has been some further uh, significant loss of channel capacity. The Rangatike is silting up and the limitations of flood mitigation works are graphically illustrated by a June storm. The river is up, the floodgates are closed, and Bill Jamison's newly sown pasture is underwater again. Once the river rises, the floodgate shuts off, and this, this just starts banking up. And, uh, and this is the highest I've seen it for, uh, for three years since we've been here. And, uh, yeah, it's not the nicest of... Uh, sites but what can you do you're just gonna you know you can't do a damn thing about it so uh yeah you know you just gotta fight on it's something that needs to be dealt with it's it's you know as far as i'm concerned for me and my family and for the community you know, it's it's a crisis and every time it rains you know we're thinking god what's going to happen this time when i came down the road and saw the river bursting its banks again it was just utter panic you know, how long do we have to live with that? 
which raises the question just what can be done for the many places in New Zealand like Scotts Ferry. Dr Troy Baisden reckons that communities can be proactive. It may mean that you need to ask for higher stop banks or better stop banks. It may mean that you need to hold insurance. Um, it may mean that you need to lobby the government to help insure you. There, there are a lot of possibilities there. The long-term solution probably lies in encouraging better high country farming practices. More than a century of land clearance for grazing has left the ground acutely prone to slippage. Environment Waikato has just created a plan called Project Watershed, where ratepayers who have farms in hill country that lose a fair amount of sediment into the Waikato River system actually pay more if they could institute practices that would reduce the flood volume or the amount of sediment their farms are releasing. If they clean up their act, then they pay less. Back down at Scotts Ferry, the river and the flood take a back seat to the Hawk homecoming. Julie Hawk has determined that nothing's going to rain on her parade. Have you got your dog here? Are we going to have to put a thing in here, do you The skies are grey and it's a little damp, but the great day has finally arrived. The family are moving back just 16 weeks after they were forced to evacuate. You've got to go up there. Up there. As usual, Julie has organised the move with almost military precision. Are they both coming in here? Yeah. Wave upon wave of tradesmen, contractors and suppliers attack the problem. And whenever the advance slows, Julie's there to urge them on. And then you get under it. It's a very different story up the Parawanui Road. Work on the Renshaw home has all but stopped. The mood here is one of deep frustration. We thought that we would be back in the house before the middle of winter. Uh, shortest days coming up and we're still four, five or, four, yeah, four five or five, six weeks, weeks away. We don't, still don't have a confirmed date that we can look at moving back in. Um, yeah, that's starting to drag on and it's starting to get yeah, a bit cold. The family are now camping in a packing shed on the orchard. Not only were they missing home, but life in bulls had become intolerable. The kids were very unsettled up in town, uh, so were we. We didn't sleep, you know, we heard every single noise. Um, and we had a, a guy come over and threaten to kill the dog up in town, you know, and that's the sort of thing we don't need. Um, it's not us. We, we, we belong here. This is our home. This is where we want to be. Oh, now we know we're home. When we come back, party time at the ferry and a new baby arrives in the middle of a storm. Now we know we're home. It's party time in Scotts Ferry. <laughs> the Hawks are the first residents back home and in record time. Well, it made it nice now, hasn't she? But full insurance cover and Julie's gold-plated contacts with the local tradespeople are not the norm. Oh, we'll be another two or three, three months, I would imagine. Yeah. You haven't got the go-go of Julie, you know. Julie, when she goes, she goes. <laughs> the vast majority of other Scots Ferry families are still out of their homes, and it's causing stress and more than a little heartbreak. The fact that we haven't got the house to live in, that the property is still sort of up in the air, it's not all put back together the way it was. We, you know, we are feeling the financial strain a wee bit, we haven't been able to get all the fencing and things done that we'd hoped to get done. You just, yeah, you feel like giving up, yeah. 
It's been a strain on their relationship and counselling has not provided the answers. It is, yeah, it, things have taken a bit of a turn for us. Um, sort of post flood. Um, yeah, it's, it's been pretty hard actually. It's, it's a lot of strain, a lot of stress. Um, everyone's had to deal with it. Um. Paul and I aren't living together at the moment. I've, there's a lot of issues there that go back before the flooding, but the more I think about it, I realise that the flooding has had a lot to do with it. I've, like I said to you before, I've, I feel I'm feeling the strain myself, and I'm not coping terribly well with what's going on. And perhaps that's been part of the big downfall of the communication that's broken down between us. It was something I never, ever thought that I would have to deal with in my lifetime. Um, when we bought this property, it never, never came to me that we were actually living on a floodplain and that we were so vulnerable. Um. A July storm sees the river spilling over at almost the same point as the torrent that burst through in February. The good news is that Horizons Regional Council's heightened state of flood readiness sees the timely appearance of emergency gangs with machinery and sandbags. This is just the overflow from, from the river jumping out of its main channel. The river is actually further over and the build up of material in this area here uh, lost its capacity so therefore the water's come up higher than uh, what it would normally be. Getting over this bank is the main concern. The flood is contained, much to the delight of Bill Jamison, who for once this year does not get more water over his pastures. And Bill's news just gets better and better. After six months, his cows are coming home. In stock trucks, 40 or so at a time, the herd returns, just in time to begin calving. Them back, and you know, uh, okay, there's a bit of work to be done on them, but uh, I suppose in general they're not too bad. Um, they've been waved for such a long time since the flood, and they've had a hell of a time. They've uh, seen more trucks in the last six months uh, than I would think a cow would see in their lifetime. So uh, yeah, it's good to have them back. I suppose there's about 300 up the road to another 500 to come back. <laughs> Kidding me. Oh, OK, dude. Great day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, see you later. Best of all, he's a new dad. Matthew arrived with the new month, and Jody reckons that this little future gate opener is a real chip off the old block. Hey, what do you reckon? <laughs> and a good little dagger in here. That's the big hands. Mm. 